Hi, I'm Laura Ingwell, a specialty crops extension entomologist with Purdue University, and I'm here today at the Purdue Student Farm just off campus to talk to you about uh, seed corn maggot and onion maggot. Um, so I'm standing here in a field that was transplanted 10 days ago with um, some onion transplants. Prior to this year, the farm has not grown produce in this field. It was um, full of cover crops. And so prior to planting this year, there was a little bit of cultivation and mixing in of that organic matter. Um, but we were surprised to find that within six days of transplanting, we saw some severe damage. Onion maggot and seed corn maggot are two very closely related species, both belonging to the genus Delia. The adults resemble house flies. In our region, the flies survive as pupae over winter in the soil. And when spring comes and that soil begins to warm and we accumulate growing degree days for the flies, they will eventually emerge from that soil and locate suitable host plants to oviposit and lay their eggs on. Things that are particularly attractive to these flies are high levels of organic matter in the soil. They can cue in on the smells associated with organic decomposition and find those as a suitable place to lay eggs. So some of the factors that are contributing to the infestations that we're seeing in this field include that high organic matter in the soil, which we're aiming for for good, healthy crop production, and also the fluctuations in the weather that we're experiencing. So right now, it is the first week of May. We have seen some days in the 70s and 80s in Fahrenheit, um, but more typically, it's been sort of a cool, wet spring with warm days scattered in here and there. So in that situation, the larvae and the eggs of these flies will thrive in that cool soil. There are a variety of factors that could contribute to wilting, especially shortly after transplanting. For instance, these onions came out of the greenhouse. They didn't have much time to harden off. So we were anticipating a little bit of a transplant shock, a little bit of wilting in the onions. But when that wilting was so severe, we decided to investigate and go down a little further and see what was happening to these transplants. What we often want to do is dig up the soil around that and be able to investigate the root and the base of the plant and look for any suspected damage. So they start out as eggs in the soil and as those eggs hatch, they burrow down, they feed on the roots, and then they move up into the onion and the plant material itself. When we have young transplants like this, they're very susceptible and this type of um, maggot feeding will lead to plant death. As we get bigger and more vigorous plants later in the season, um, onions can generally tolerate this type of feeding, but you may see some aesthetic damage or deformation on the bulb, but the plants themselves will survive. The onion maggot species is fairly specific in its host range and specializes on feeding on alliums. Um, so that does include onions and garlic and, and other allium crops. However, the seed corn maggot has a much broader host range and you can find that oftentimes feeding on corn um, and moving into allium and onion crops where we see a bit of overlap. Um, in Indiana, we often hear about seed corn maggot affecting untreated sweet corn that's planted um, and young melon transplants in the field. When we have cool wet springs, we can see damage from that. There are a few different cultural strategies that we can implement to minimize the amount of damage caused by these maggot seed feeders. Um, one of those revolves around organic matter, which is a bit conflicting because we want to increase organic matter in our fields. So some of the others include uh, monitoring the development of the insects themselves and delaying our planting times so that we me miss the peak emergence and flight of the adults in the spring. So we can do this um, by tracking the development days over 40 degrees at which the flies are accumulating and developing in the soil and we can delay our planting or our transplanting to miss that. If you have a fairly small farm you could plant early but use a protective cover over those young transplants to block the flies from being able to oviposit on those young plants. Um, the flies themselves have three to four generations per year, but like I mentioned earlier, as the crops get older and bigger, they can tolerate that damage um, much better than young transplants, which are the most susceptible and can become killed. The most efficacious way to control these pests is through the application of seed treatments. 
Um, so this is applying an insecticide to the outside coating of the seed and when that seed is directly transplanted into the ground, the chemical moves into the growing tissues. And therefore when you have a newly emerging seed that's very attractive to the seed feeding maggots, um, it's protected by that insecticide. However, that strategy has to be used prior to any sort of monitoring to see if the flies and the pests are going to be there. So an alternative um, way to use chemical control is to do in furrow tr um, drenches. So this is a similar mode where you put the chemical in the furrow in the line when you're transplanting and the chemical is systemic and moves into the, the plant at, at that time and protects that young tissue. Um, but again, you usually have to make that determination at the time of transplant, but looking at the accumulation of degree days can help you predict the abundance or emergence of flies in relation to when you're planting those, those seedlings. Foliar applications are not efficacious as this insect is underground and in the roots and in the soil, and it is not efficacious to try to treat the adults. So really we have to be preemptive in our management strategies and monitor um, and think about crop placement and crop timing to minimize the damage from these pests. Mm -hmm.